Hi, welcome to NASA's Kitchen. We are here today inside the uh, NASA's Space Food Laboratory here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. While everyone here is getting ready for this Thanksgiving holiday, complete with the uh, perfect turkey and all the trimmings, we are here today talking to uh, Vicki Clores, our food, NASA food scientist, who's going to talk a little about how the uh, crew aboard the International Space Station, we have three who are living in space now, including uh, NASA astronaut Kevin Ford, who are going to be celebrating their Thanksgiving there aboard the International Space Station, flying about 230 miles above Earth. Vicki, thank you for being here to come talk to us about how they're going to celebrate their Thanksgiving and the food system there aboard the space station. Well, you're welcome, and I'd like to start by wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Um, we have several options in our food system for the crew members to choose from uh, to, so they can kind of select what they want to have for their Thanksgiving meal. But we do have uh, some of the traditional items available. So we have smoked turkey. Uh, we also have uh, a dressing, a cornbread dressing that's rehydratable. They can add hot water to that. We have green beans and uh, mushrooms. We have broccoli au gratin. We have mashed potatoes. Um, we have bread products, and for dessert, we have uh, cobblers. So we have a cherry blueberry cobbler, apricot cobbler that they can choose from. So we have many of the traditional, we also have yams. Uh, we have many of the traditional items that uh, we think of as being a traditional Thanksgiving. Uh, so they can choose from all of that to make up their Thanksgiving meal or their Christmas meal coming up next right. month as well. So for a number of items for the crew to actually choose from. And from my, what I understand, um, Sunny, just before she left, had left um, some uh, uh, fluffy marshmallows for, or marshmallow fluff for, um, for uh, Kevin so he can add to his yams. So perhaps he'll be making, whipping up some candied yams yes. um, this Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So um, first, before we even get into more um, talking about the space food, some, uh, space food, I would like to talk to you a little about your role here as the NASA food scientist. In fact, we had polled Twitter and asked some questions and um, had them send us some questions. And one of those questions there are, um, from Joshua Stern, what does it take to become a NASA food scientist? Well, uh, food science is, uh, you know, their food scientists typically uh, work in the industry and do product development and uh, quality assurance for food companies. Uh, I started here with one of the contractors who uh, was working on the shuttle food system, actually. I started uh, quite a few years ago, 1985, and so I worked here for several years for a contractor before um, becoming a civil servant, uh, and I actually started as civil servant manager of the shuttle food system. Okay. Uh, and eventually transitioned over to managing the space station food system. Okay. Um, so we actually have several food scientists here. Um, on the NASA side, we currently have three food scientists, um, myself, and then we have uh, one food scientist who's working on what we call our advanced food technology program. So that's our uh, research arm, if you will, of our future food systems. And then we have a new food scientist who came on board recently and she's working the uh, Orion and the exploration class food systems, the operational systems of the future. Uh, because uh, the, myself and the AFT food scientist, Michelle Perchonik, we're both, we're not ready to retire yet, but we're getting closer. And so uh, Grace is going to be our uh, food scientist of the future after Michelle and I are gone. Okay, great. So I want to talk to you a little about um, what, Talk to me about the ISS food system. What exactly is that? What does it entail? Okay. Well, we have, um, to start with, people have to understand that we have an all-shelf stable food system, meaning we have no dedicated freezers or refrigerators for food. So that requires all of our food processing to um, <clears throat> last, our food has to last a long time at room temperature. Uh, it's called, in, that's what they call shelf stable. So it has to be sh stable on the shelf for a very long time. The only refrigeration we have on orbit, they do have a small chiller where they can actually chill a beverage. So um, the water that we have on station, they either have hot water or ambient water, room temperature water. So when they prepare a beverage, if they want it to be chilled, they're going to have to put it in this chiller and let it chill for a while. It's small. It's about the volume, internal volume of a typical home microwave. So okay. not very large, but it does allow them to have a chilled beverage after they exercise. 
And for about the first 10 years on Space Station, they didn't even have that option. Mm -hmm. The chiller was added uh, when we went to crew of six on Space Station, and we added a second food preparation area. So the chiller's only been there a relatively short while compared to the life of the International Space sure. Station. But they really appreciate having a chilled beverage when they have to exercise a lot every day, yeah. and they get hot and sweaty. and. And so they like the idea of having a chiller now. Sure. <clears throat> but, and, and I understand, you know, food, while it's important, you know, to our bodies to sustain, to sustain our lives, but it's also, there's a psychological aspect yes. to it. And can you talk to me a little about that? Yeah. When I first came to work here and all we were flying was short shuttle flights, uh, food really was low on the totem pole as far as uh, priority because, you know, most crew members that flew on shuttle felt like, well, it's a camping trip. You know, no big deal, I can find something to eat. So very few of them were, you know, very concerned with what was on the menu or available to them to eat. But as we went into the phase one program and our crew members went and began to stay on Mir for extended period of time, they began to realize that food, the longer you're there, the more important it becomes because it's one of the few creature comforts that you do have on orbit. And so um, those first crew members who transitioned to long duration space flight, they quickly spread the word among the rest of the astronauts that food becomes more and more important the longer you're staying on orbit. And so for our International Space Station crew members who are now staying typically about six months at a time on orbit, um, the psychological aspect of the food is extremely important. And so they pay a lot of attention uh, our basic menu on Space Station is a standard menu, and it includes all of the foods and beverages that we have, and we have about 200 different foods and beverages on the U.S. side, so it's a pretty big selection, but we do allow our crew members to augment that standard menu with uh, nine bon what we call bonus containers, and those um, uh, are of their own choice. They can choose more, you know, they can choose their favorites from our food system, or they can also choose commercial off-the-shelf products that meet our shelf life requirements and our microbiological requirements. And so the crew members focus a great deal of time on what to put in those bonus containers because that that is their it's that's kind of their a big, snack pack in yeah, their pantry. So. Yeah, and it's a big part of their psychological aspect of the sure. food because that's what they get to choose and that's going to be the little special things that they have. Um, sometimes it can be uh, dessert type items, but often it's it's commercial entrees that they want, like maybe a thermostabilized uh, Indian food or something you know of that nature. So ethnic foods are often part of what they choose for their bonus containers. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence from crew members that foods, some foods, not all foods, but some foods taste different to them when they get on orbit than they did on the ground. And it works both ways. We'll have crew members select something thinking they're really gonna like it when they get on orbit and then they don't. Or we'll have crew members come back and say, I didn't like this on the ground, but boy, when I got on orbit, I, I tasted it and I was really sorry I hadn't taken more. Yeah. And so, um, and we really feel like that a lot of that has to do with the change in the aroma that they're getting from the food. So most of the way that you and I perceive the taste of a food, a big part of that is the smell, the, smell. the aroma that you get from the food. And so like when you and I have a cold here on the ground, everything tastes like cardboard or tastes like nothing because you, you aren't getting aroma from it your so because your nose is congested. Because this package here, it's not going to be... Right. And so uh, when they get on orbit, of course, when they first go into orbit, they're going to be congested from the fluid shift that occurs. But that'll dissipate over time mm -hmm. to a certain degree. But then they've lot, got a lot of other things that are interfering with their ability to get aroma from the food. They are eating out of a package rather than off a plate. And on orbit, uh, hot air doesn't necessarily rise. It's going to, some of it will rise, but uh, it disperses in other directions. So mm -hmm. it limits how much aroma you're getting from the food. Okay. Plus you're in a confined environment with a lot of other competing odors, some of which aren't necessarily pleasant. And so all of that taken together does, it's not too surprising that they feel like their taste buds are somewhat dulled. Sure. Now, the other possibility is that microgravity is somehow affecting the taste receptors on the tongue. And there have been, you know, the sweet, sour, salty, bitter mm -hmm. 
TACE receptors. There have been a couple of attempts over the years um, on the shuttle to, and in bed rest studies to try to see if that is happening. Um, the one that was made on the shuttle was done on a very short duration flight and so the results were inconclusive. And our research team, our advanced food technology team, has actually proposed to do an experiment on orbit on station with long duration crew members to see if we can quantify scientifically that there might be a change in those taste receptors that could be contributing to this perceived change of flavor in foods. Right. This is fascinating because we're still learning how yes. microgravity you know, treats our bodies. And mm -hmm. um, So one of the questions that we have on Twitter as well, and this is something, that rumor has it that also they prefer spicy food, and I understand it it's probably has to do with this aroma. Right. Um, that's the theory, but mm -hmm. his question, this is, comes from Alex Zamora. If spicy food is most popular, why not send up hot sauce or make everything spicy? Well, okay, the, uh, let me deal with the second part first. The reason we don't make everything spicy is because uh, we also have crew members who don't necessarily, not all crew members really want the spiciness. The so we'd rather have the condiments available and let them add it. Uh, some of our foods do have spice in them. For instance, we have a freeze-dried shrimp cocktail that has horseradish sauce in it, so it has a nice little kick, and a lot of our crew members really like that. And we also have to take into account the fact that many of our international partners who are consuming our foods at time aren't necessarily all that interested in having really spicy foods because their diets are different uh, as far as the level of spice than, mm -hmm. than we might have here. Um, but we do have a lot of condiments available to crew members. One of the things that they can take, we have a standard set of condiments that we send, but one of the things that is very popular for crew members to take in bonus containers is hot sauce, salsa, those kind of things. They can take those with them, and many of them do, to add to the food. Add their flavor. Mm -hmm. Great. And so another question here, and this is relevant all to this Thanksgiving meal. John Knight wants to know, what has been the most popular Thanksgiving meal on the ISS? Well, I would say the most popular has been our traditional sliced turkey that we have available with things like mashed potatoes and the, yam, the candied yams that we have uh, and you know maybe the cobblers for dessert. That typically has been the most popular. And now all of these items are available in the standard menu, but many of our crew members, when they know they're gonna be on orbit for a holiday, they'll go ahead and assemble that meal in their bonus container so that it's all in one place and when they're ready to, to, you know, they know it's in that container and they don't have to go looking for it in the various right. containers. So uh, many of them will do that. If they know they're there for a holiday, they'll go ahead and decide what they're going to eat for that meal, set it aside in their bonus container so that it's there and ready to go when they go to celebrate. And so real quick, just briefly, because we're going to need to wrap up here, um, talk to me about how they'll be cooking, because I know we'll be having to thaw the turkey and all this stuff, and, and it's <laughs> very long, and it seems like it's a For them, it's different. very simple. Uh, these packages of food, uh, the thermostabilized products, if they want them warmed, they have a suitcase food warmer that they open up and it's got a hot plate down the center. It's got cavities on both sides where they load these pouches in, close it up, plug it in, in about 20, 25 minutes, depending on how hot they want it, those foods are ready to go. Okay. For something like this rehydratable product, they're going to add water from the rehydration station. In this case, they would add hot water. It tells them how much to add, about how long they need to wait for the product to absorb the water. So they'll inject the water, they'll manipulate it a little bit with their fingers before they cut the package open to stir the water and the food together. Uh, and then they'll wait for it to absorb the water. And the water is hot enough that typically they can just cut it open and eat it once it's rehydrated. So they don't have to like warm it up after sure. that because the water is hot enough. Um, beverages, again, if they want it chilled, they're going to have to hydrate it ahead of time and give it some time in the chiller if they want to have a chilled beverage. So there's really not a lot, you know, it's mostly just warming or adding water. So there's not a lot of cooking going on. Well, I haven't done my shopping yet. Any chance I can just bag this up and take it home sure. with me? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, Vicki, thanks so much for coming out or, or letting us here, sure. here inside your kitchen and showing us all about this. And again, from our table to yours, happy Thanksgiving.